Have you ever been stabbed in the back? Before you answer that question, let me explain to you exactly what that phrase means. It actually was originated after World War II in Germany. Germany lost the war. But there were people in Germany who felt that it was because the leaders in Germany had signed an armistice and that it had they just let the army and the military fight that they would have won it. So they developed the slogan, you stabbed us in the back, meaning it's not the enemy that is our enemy, it's the people in our own country that has stabbed us in the back by signing that armistice and not letting us win the war. So that little phrase, stabbed in the back, means that a friend has stabbed you in the back. I asked several people this week, have you ever been stabbed in the back? And they all said yes. And then one said, and then they twist it. <laughs> if they're a friend, that's what they do. Now, when that happens, how do you handle that? Matter of fact, I think it would be interesting. I've often thought that instead of me just uh, speaking in this kind of a situation, I used to say, let's pass out three by five cards and you have write down uh, how you were stabbed in the back, or what might be even more interesting is to have uh, you stand up and tell us. I'm not going to do that. But wouldn't it be interesting? Because I suspect that virtually everybody listening to me would say that at some time or another they have been stabbed in the back. Do you agree? Raise your hand. Let's do that. Virtually everybody. I didn't see anybody that didn't raise their hand. All right, then here's the question. How do you handle that? Well, in the Psalms, David wrote a psalm when that had happened to him. So let's see how he handled it. Turn with me to Psalm 55. If you don't have a Bible with you, there's one in the pew rack before you. And it would be helpful if you looked at the passage as we go through it. Psalm 55. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is... Uh, point to some verses that explain what's going on in this chapter. As a matter of fact, the Psalms were written usually in response to something that's going on in the author's life, and that is the case in Psalm 55. So David tells us in the Psalm uh, what's going on, and the rest of the Psalm addresses it. So look at verse 12. He said, For it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor it is one who hates me who has exalted himself against me, then I could hide from him. But it was you, a man my equal, my companion, my acquaintance. So David is saying, whatever he's talking about in this passage is centered in these two verses. That is, he's saying, uh, I've been stabbed in the back. And if it was an enemy, it would be easier to take. But it's by, and look at what he says in verse 13, it's by my equal, my companion, my acquaintance. And he goes on to describe some other things that indicate that these were very close friends of his that had done this. Now, there are some guesses about who that might have been as you look at his life in Samuel. But the truth is, we're not absolutely certain exactly who it was in his case. But it really doesn't matter. The question is, have you been stabbed in the back by a friend? And that is what he's talking about. So in this passage, what he does is three things. First of all, he makes a plea for himself. Look at verse 1. Give ear to my prayer, O God, and do not hide your safe from my supplication. Attend to me and hear me. I am restless in my complaint and mourn noisily. So in these opening verses, he's simply saying, Lord, hear me. That sounds like a strange thing to say to God, doesn't it? Uh, you ever said that to somebody? Just, just listen to me. Hear me. 
Well, I'd like to suggest to you that one of the deepest needs in life is to have somebody hear you. And that one of the saddest things in life is when nobody hears you and understands exactly what's going on in your life. So David is just filled with emotion. That's what the Psalms are about anyway. And in this one, he's just overflowed with emotion. And he's saying, Lord, and look at how he says it. Hear me. Do not hide yourself from my supplication. Attend to me. He says again in verse 2, hear me. So he's simply pleading with the Lord, please listen to me. Now then he explains why. That's verse 3. Because of the voice of the enemy, because of the opposition of the wicked, for they bring down trouble upon me, and in wrath they hate me. Now, if you were reading this psalm beginning at verse 1, and you encountered verse 3, you would think that it's about an enemy that's opposed to him. And that's certainly what he's saying in verse 3. But as I pointed out just a minute ago, later he explains that this enemy was once a friend. And that's what's causing the excessive emotion that he is expressing. They oppress me. They hate me. Some have suggested that this is a person that has been offended and they're trying to get even by what they are doing to David, that they're holding a grudge, so to speak. One author has said, that what David is going through is this. He's restless in complaining. He's distracted by the shouts of the enemy, oppressed by the wicked, buried by them with heaps of trouble, exposed to assaults, heartbroken with anguish, terrified by impending doom, afflicted by uncontrolling trembling, overwhelmed with horror. Now, you ever felt like that? You ever had those kinds of emotions? What do you do? You pray. What do you think? Uh, you know, God will listen, but he doesn't really understand, right? I mean, you've got to go through what I'm going through to really understand this. Well, let me just share with you that he understands. Whatever you're going through, he understands. Let me read you the passage that says that. In Hebrews chapter 4, it says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we without sin. Let us draw with confidence near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Did you hear that verse? He says he can sympathize with us because he's gone through everything we've gone through. Now, without me going into a lot of detail, let me just mention one thing. We're talking about being stabbed in the back by a friend, right? Did that ever happen to Jesus? You know the guy's name. His name was Judas. So if, if you think he could understand that, well, the book of Hebrews said yes, and come boldly to the throne of grace that you might find mercy and grace to help in time of need. So in this first part, David is simply pleading with the Lord to hear him. In this part, he describes his pain. Look at verse 4. My heart is severely pained within me, and the terror of death has fallen upon me. So as the result of this experience, he describes severe pain. Now what kind of pain might that be? Well, he describes it the terror of death. The pain I'm experiencing is like facing death. That's the kind of intense pain I'm feeling. In verse 5, he says, fearfulness and trembling have come upon me. Horror has overwhelmed me. So his pain included fear, trembling, and horror. Verse 6, so I said, 
Oh, that I might have wings like a dove, that I would fly away and be at rest. Interesting. I, I, I think this one of the most interesting verses in this whole passage. He says, I am under so much stress and pressure and pain. I wish I had wings and could fly away like a dove. Were you ever in a situation you wish you could just leave town? Yes. You ever felt like that? Let me give you the spiritual version of it. If you're a spiritual person, what you say is, Lord, this is a good day for you to come back. <laughs> but it's all the same thing, right? But that's the way we feel. I just want to get out of Dodge. Some eloquent author has said, David wished that he had wings, not like a hawk that flies strongly, but like a dove that flies swiftly. He wishes for wings not to fly upon the prey, but to fly, upon, uh, but to fly from the birds of prey. For such is his enemies. He wanted to be like doves that fly low and take shelter as soon as they can, and thus he wanted to just fly away. Ever felt like a dove? Did, wanted to be like a dove to just fly away. He says in verse 7, Indeed, I would wander far off and remain in the wilderness, Selah. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. Boy, is this interesting. He says, I want to I be like a dove and just fly away. And then he says, and I want to go far away. I want to get so far away from this situation. I don't care if I'm in the wilderness. I just want to get away from the wind of the storm of this emotion that is overcoming me. Is this vivid or what? It's the way all of us have felt at some time or another, only he puts it in poetic words. So he is saying, I do just hurt so bad. I want to get out of here. That sums up what this is saying. And in the context of this chapter, it has to do with a friend who has stabbed him in the back, so to speak. I look for some stories that, of people like this. I even ask a few people, have you gone through this? And I heard some horrific stories. But I chose to use one that I found on the Internet where a couple helped a fella. She describes in detail, the wife, how they paid for his ticket. They helped him get his license back. They got, helped him get a car. They even helped him get a place to stay in their own home. And the husband was a mechanic who ran a garage, and they gave him a job. So what he did is he told all the customers, they're overcharging you, and if you'll come to my house after hours, I'll fix it cheaper. And what got my attention about that story is she ended it by saying, it broke my heart. This can get to be real painful stuff. I read another story of a lady who had a friend that she worked with. They'd worked together for three years. The friend had a boyfriend who worked there, but because of a problem with drinking, he got fired. And then the two of them planned a robbery. So he comes back after he's fired. When this lady is there by herself, and is terrified looking down the barrel of a gun and later found out that it was her friend who posed as the lookout to tell her boyfriend when to go in when the lady was alone. And this is what caught my attention. She said that she was diagnosed with extreme anxiety and PTFD, being robbed, she said, I still have flashbacks. Interesting. That can linger. When you've really been hurt by somebody else, the pain can last and last and last until you just want to run away as 
far as you can, even to the wilderness. Does this describe our experience or what? I'll make a few comments before we go to the next step. Um, one of my favorite books in the Bible is um, the book of James. And it opens with uh, enduring trials or having trials. And when I teach that book, I point out that a critical issue in James is that you don't run away. Uh, that you hang in there because God can use that to teach you something. In the book of James, that's the point. And I recall saying, what are you going to run to? People run off. Uh, sometimes they literally run away physically. They just get out of town, get out of Dodge. Another option is to run to something like a bottle or an affair. Just run. Well, that has a problem. If you run away, whatever you do, it isn't going to solve the problem because the pain is in the heart and you're going to take it with you. That's the problem. So James is saying you need to endure. That's what James says. So in this case, you don't, don't do what David felt like doing. It's my point. You just hang in there. At any rate, the first thing David does is he asks the Lord to hear him because he's in so much agony and severe emotional pain. Now, if you've been stabbed in the back, that involves a second person, the person who stabbed you. So what David does next is he talks to the Lord about the people who stabbed him in the back. And this gets real interesting. Look at verse 9. He says, destroy, O Lord. And divide their tongue. Whoa. Destroy? That's pretty strong language. What does he mean? Well, you could speculate that he's saying destroy their plans. Is he saying destroy their person? He says destroy. And divide their tongue. What does that mean? Talk about heard about hair splitting. This is tongue splitting. You divide the tongue. Well, this is probably an expression of back to Babel where they confused, the Lord confused their languages and he is perhaps saying something similar to that. At any rate, in the latter part of verse 9, he says, for, now, this is very important. Look at verse 9 carefully. He says, destroy, O Lord, for, how many times have you heard me say for? He's going to explain what I just said. Or I'm going to give you an illustration of it. Well, in this case, I'm going to explain to you why I want you to destroy them. This is very important. For I have seen violence and strife in the city. Oh, these people didn't just stab David in the back. This is a whole lot bigger than David in this case. And these people were violent and they caused strife in the city. And the city is probably the city of Jerusalem. But the point is that this is a whole lot bigger than David. That there is violence and strife in the city. There's more. Look at verse 10. Day and night they go around on its walls. Iniquity and trouble are also in the midst of it. So he adds to the violence and strife in verse 9, iniquity and trouble in verse 10. So there is no peace in the city. A few verses ago, David said, I wish I had wings like a dove to fly away and be at rest. What he wanted was peace. And when you get into this kind of situation, what you really want is peace. Well, he's saying, there was no peace in me, and now there's no peace in the city. That these people are really causing 
havoc. Look at verse 11. It gets worse. Destruction is in its midst. Oppression and deceit do not depart from its streets. So just look at all the things he said this person or these people are, is causing. Violence, strife, iniquity, trouble, destruction, oppression, and deceit. That's why he says in verse 9, destroy, O Lord. It's because of what they are doing. He goes on in verse 12 to say, for it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor it is one who hates me and who has exalted himself against me, then I could hide from him. So as I explained at the very beginning, he's saying they're doing all of this. And it wasn't my enemy that was doing it. But he says in verse 13, but it was you. Now, this is critical. Notice he now talks directly to the person who is causing all the problems. It was you. A man, my equal, my companion, my acquaintance. He says, look, if this were some enemy, I could handle it. It would be easier to handle it. He said, but this was a close friend, or at least a former friend, who came along and stabbed him in the back. Notice how close this friend was. Look at verse 14. We took sweet counsel together and walked to the house of God in the throng. So this is not just a friend. It is a close friend. It is a close spiritual friend. So he says... Lord, this is really hard to take. That these are the people, or this is the person who is doing this. We even went to church together. We walked to the house of God together. Now, you know, I think this is the ultimate of just the extent of what's going on. That you not only have somebody that you would consider a friend, and a close friend, but a spiritual friend. Have you ever had a spiritual friend turn on you? I think that's like plunging in the knife and turning it. You know, it makes it even worse. So he then gets to the point. You ready for this? Fasten your seatbelt. It's about to get interesting. Look at verse 15. Let death seize them. Let them go down alive into hell, for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. Whoa! That's about as strong a verse as I've seen in a long time. I mean, I've read some Psalms where it was strong and he wanted their death. But look at this. Let death seize them and go to hell. Do you see that? Is that in your translation? Oh, it's worse. It doesn't say go to hell. It says go alive to hell. Whoa. How you explain that? I thought we were supposed to turn the other cheek. <laughs> what is going on? Well, in the first place, hell here is Sheol. He's saying, he's saying, let them go alive to death. So he isn't exactly saying, let them go to hell. Um, he is saying, I'm praying for their physical death. That's bad enough, right? So, how do you justify that? Well, you have to grapple with this a little bit. I mean, can you just blanketly do that to anybody that stabbed you in the back? No, I'm not sure. Let me make a couple of suggestions. In the first place, this is bigger than David. That's obvious from the fact that they just talked about that they've affected the whole city, and that's probably Jerusalem. And even though they're attacking David, they're attacking God because David 
is God's anointed. And that's what's going on in his life at this point. So there's a situation here that's bigger than just the ordinary stabbing in the back. But be that as it may, I do think there's a place in the scripture for asking God for justice. And I think that's what's going on here. So he is praying for justice. I think there's another angle here too. If the city is filled with violence and destruction, remember we saw that a minute ago? Then this is a prayer for prevention. How many times have you ever heard somebody whose relative was murdered or killed and they wanted the person who did it brought to justice and then they would say, I don't want somebody else to go through what I've just gone through. You ever heard that? I think that's going on here. That we, he's praying that, uh, that, that this person be stopped because they are causing so much destruction. Now, you cannot read this passage of scripture and understand what's going on today in the world without seeing a connection. As we all know, Russia has invaded Ukraine. I think this applies. I think we need to do what the scripture says and pray that spiritual leaders, world leaders, I should say, have wisdom so that we can live in peace. So peace is a priority in the scripture. We should pray for peace. But there is no doubt in my mind that what is going on in that situation is downright evil and that we should pray that God stops it. And that may mean that we eliminate the wicked people who are doing it. Have you prayed? I've watched the news and prayed. Lord, do something. This is so complicated and so serious. Only God can solve this problem. So Lord, do it. And do it quick. And eliminate some people if that's what you need to do. There is a time to pray for justice. There is a time to pray for somebody's demise. And if you want a historical example, probably the greatest example I could think of is Hitler. Just pray that he just, somebody eliminate him. He is causing so much damage and so much destruction that he needs to be eliminated. That's a biblical truth. You got that from the Bible. Amen? Remember it. All right, I said David did three things. I've told you so far about two. Number one, he prayed for himself. Lord, just hear me. I hurt. Just hear me. He poured out his pain before the Lord. And the second thing he did is he prayed for the guy or the guys that did it. And he says, Lord, look what they're doing. Look at the violence and the strife and the iniquity that they're, they're destroying a whole city. So, Lord, destroy them. Then he does a third thing. He then just uh, talks to the Lord about his relationship to the Lord. Look at verse uh, 16. As for me, I will call upon God. And the Lord will save me. Now, if you've heard me teach the Psalms before, you've heard me say that the word saved in the Psalms is not talking about salvation, spiritual salvation. It's talking about deliverance. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew word means deliverance. It can be translated saved. But the idea is being delivered from some physical danger. So notice what he says. Notice carefully what this verse says. I will call upon who? What does the text say? I will call upon God and the... What's the next word? Is that interesting? I'm going to call upon God and the Lord is going to save me. Oh, what's the difference? 
Well, in the scripture, God is, the general word for God is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He's the creator. But Lord, notice it's all capital letters, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That means this is the personal name of God. We sometimes call it Jehovah. It's probably better translated Yahweh. He's going to call on God and Yahweh is going to deliver me. In other words, he is saying the God, the all-powerful creator of the world, is going to take a personal interest in him. He uses the personal name of God. God is going to take a personal interest in me. The creator of the world is going to take a personal interest in me. That's what that verse is saying. So I'm going to call on the Lord and I am confident he is going to deliver me from this wretched, wicked person who has stabbed me in the back. By the way, is that a New Testament idea? Cast all your care upon him, 1 Peter 5, 7, for he cares about you. He knows the number of hairs on your head which means he's a mathematician because he has to recount every day, <laughs> right? So he knows all about you, knows all those hairs that are missing. And so he cares about what happens to you. That's the point. So whatever's bothering you, give it to him. I think I've told you Patricia has a sign in our bedroom that says, give it to God and go to sleep. Well, that's what it's saying. And what do you get out of that? Peace. Right? I mean, there's pain, and he's pouring the pain out, and he's confident the Lord's going to give him peace. So Paul says, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. Let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God you can explain to people will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So if you include the Lord in this, what you get is peace. Which, by the way, remember earlier in the passage he said, I wish I had wings like a dove and I could fly away? And be at rest? You don't get rest flying to the desert. You get rest flying to the Lord. And that's the point. So he says, I'm confident the Lord is going to do this. Verse 17, evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry and he shall hear my voice. We started the psalm saying, hear me, hear me. And at this point he says, and I'm confident God is going to hear me. And then he says in verse 18, he has redeemed my soul in peace from the battle that is against me, for there are many against me. So in spite of how many there are, the Lord is going to give me peace. He says in verse 19, God will hear and afflict them, even who abide from old. Now, uh, this verse needs to be understood He's saying, I'm confident the Lord is going to deliver me. And in this verse, he's saying, because I've seen him do it in the past. I've seen him do it, so I'm confident that he will do it. Then he says in verse 21, the words of my mouth were, uh, the words of his mouth were smooth, smoother than butter, but there was war in his heart. Now he's talking about he's going to have peace in the midst of all this chaos that's going on. And he's talking about the fact that he's talking about his enemy again. And he says, you know, he had smooth words, this guy. I mean, he could have been a good used car salesman. But there was war in his heart. But I'm going to have peace because I'm confident the Lord's going to deliver me. That's the context. Now, he ends it by saying this. Verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. 
he shall permit, not never permit the righteous to be moved. But you, O God, will bring down to the pit the destruction, bloodthirsty and deceitful men who shall not live out half their days, but I will trust you. Now, here's what's going on. When somebody stabs you in the back, there are three people involved. You, the stabber, and the Lord. Right? So what he says in these two closing verses is, um, bring them down to the pit of destruction. These bloodthirsty, deceitful men. They're hurting other people. They're bloodthirsty. They're deceitful men. So I pray that you will judge them. But then he says in verse 23, but I'm going to trust you. And then he's included the Lord. Then he addresses his readers and says in verse 22, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. So he's not just thinking about himself and the knife plunger. He's thinking about the Lord and he thinks about other people that are going to go through this situation. So he is saying very simply, the Lord will sustain you. One preacher of a number of years ago said, he once bore the burden of our sin and sorrow, uh, bore our sin and our sorrow request that we should now, uh, that we should now and ever permit him to bear the burden of our cares. I didn't read that carefully enough, but the point is this. That was a very interesting insight. He who once bore the burden of our sin will now burden, uh, bear the burden of our cares. Interesting thought. Uh, from a New Testament perspective, Jesus died for us and rose from the dead. And that takes care of our sin. All we have to do to go to heaven is trust Christ, right? If God cared for us to the point that he would send his son to die for us, if he cared for us to that point, then surely he would take care of everything else. And that's sort of the point of the New Testament. That he who gave us that gift, Paul argues that in Romans chapter 8, how shall he not with him freely give us all things. If he would give us that, then he would certainly give us peace in the midst of turmoil. All right. Did you get it? Can you repeat it? <laughs> All right. Here's what's going on. When a friend turns against you, I've used the expression stab you in the back. Here's what you need to do. Number one, pour out your pain to the Lord. Number two, ask him to destroy your adversary. And number three, I mean, that's asking for justice. And number three, trust him. Trust him to give you peace in the midst of all of that. Got it? Now you know how to handle knife thrusters. It hurts. So pour out your pain. That's important. Psychologists and psychiatrists would say, don't stuff it. But if you have this pain and you stuff it, it's only going to hurt you. So get rid of it. Go talk to somebody who's been through it. Go talk to somebody who understands it. And that somebody is the Lord. Maybe some others, but it's for certain the Lord. And then the shocking thing about this whole thing is you can pray for justice. And in some cases that might mean pray for the elimination and physical death of the person. I think there are times when we need to do that. And what's the third point? Trust the Lord. 
How do you do this without the Lord? I'll tell you what you do without the Lord. You, you, you run off to the wrong thing. Or you get angry and bitter, and that only hurts you, not them. And you don't have peace. How do people do this without the Lord? I don't know how people do this without the Lord and without the encouragement of other saints around them. So when you have a friend that's unfaithful, you be faithful to the Lord and he will give you peace. I um, wondered what other people would say about how to do this. So there's a new device in my life. It's been there for a while. It didn't exist many years ago called Google it. So I thought, I wonder how other people would answer this, and I Googled it. Here's what I found. I found a website that said, what to do when you're blindsided by your best friend's betrayal. Here are five suggestions. Number one, take a step back to assess the situation. Number two, go straight to the source and demand an explanation. Good luck with that. Number three, make your friend understand the repercussions of their actions. Good luck with that. Don't get revenge. I like that one. Remind yourself that their betrayal stems from their own issues. Now, that's not all bad. A couple of these things are really right. I think you should stand back and assess the situation. That's good advice. I think don't get revenge. That's very good advice. And, and, and just be reminded that this comes from their issues. And that's exactly what this passage says. They war in their heart. Their heart is the problem. Now, that's, that's not a bad list. But what they leave out? I'm, look, I'm getting blank stares. They left out the Lord. Remember, when you're stabbed in the back, this involves three people, not two. You, the stabber, and the Lord. Please remember, the Lord was betrayed. The Lord was deserted. The Lord was denied. Of all the people, he understands this very thing. So whatever you do, don't leave him out. Amen, amen. and amen. Father, thank you for using other people to teach us truth. And in this situation, David, to teach us how to handle friends that become enemies. Now, Lord, give us the grace to do what you've told us to do. Not just once, but every time it happens. In Jesus' name, amen.